Okay, thanks all for joining uh, and welcome to the HESA Sustainable Development Seminar Series. This is going to be the, the last of a six month seminar series that's been hosted from the start of the year. We're happy to have Dr. Adam Xavier Hearn. Uh, Dr. Hearn is currently completing postdoc research and teaching posts at the University of Basel, Switzerland, where he completed his doctoral degree earlier this year, earlier this year and congratulations on that. Um, Dr. Hearn's interests are sustainable development and social change, energy and environmental justice, energy poverty, transport poverty, vulnerability, health and well-being, and sustainable mobility. Um, Dr. Hearn will be leading our seminar series today with the topic of how do religious organizations engage in sustainable uh, sustainability transitions and what are the perceived barriers to this? Dr. Hearn, welcome, and the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all, wherever you are in the world. Uh, so I'll start by sharing my screen. And you should be able to now see the full screen. Yeah. So yes, so basically today I'm going to be talking about how religious organizations engage in sustainability transitions and what the barriers and conflicts are when they are trying to make sure that they are engaging, because there's a lot of will to engage, but there are still significant problems related to how they actually engage. This is part of a wider project uh, conducted here at the University of Basel, which is titled Are Religions Becoming Green, where we examine different methodologies for uh, trying to answer whether they're becoming green or not. So, for example, we've conducted a nationwide survey of different congregations, which is going to be used for a different uh, set of uh, uh, information that, are, that will be presented at a later, later state. Uh, currently today, really what we want to do is to, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our framework, how we intended to research this, and then I'm also going to discuss the results. But basically, I'm very interested in hearing what you might have to say from your perspectives, too. So we know already that religious environmentalism is on the rise. There's a question mark there, because although from a top down perspective, we see that it most definitely is on the rise in 2015, for example, the Catholic Church issued the Laudato Si from the Pope, which discusses how not just adherents of the Catholic Church, but everybody needs to engage more in sustainability topics. But this is indeed happening in all religions all around the world. There's a real push uh, from the top down to try and make sure that members of different religious organizations engage directly in a sustainability transition. Um, in terms of religious organization, it's really important that I define this before I carry on too much. So what I'm talking about here uh, with regards to the information I'm presenting today is specifically established religious organizations. And established in the, the Swiss and German context means that these are uh, organizations which are recognized by the government. Uh, so they're not simply uh, uh, religions that are meeting outside of that. For this particular piece of research, we actually only focused on Christian organizations. So we're looking at uh, two forms of Christian organizations that are established in Switzerland, which are the Catholic Church and what's known as the Reformed or Evangelical Church. Uh, we're excluding uh, the area which is seen to be as the, the fastest uh, growing area of uh, spirituality, eco-spirituality, uh, which encompasses, for example, uh, sort of New Age beliefs, but also shamanism and so on. Uh, that wasn't dealt with at all by our research. So organized religion, one of the main reasons why we're focusing on this is because in the case of Switzerland, we have over 60% of the population that identifies as being a member of one of those two uh, uh, Christian organized religions that exist within the country. And we use the term sustainability transition rather than uh, climate change or something else, because this isn't just about climate change. It's about a lot more than that. So what we're looking at is a radical transformation towards a sustainable society, which is a response to persistent problems such as climate change, but much more than just climate change. And I'll go into a little bit more of that shortly. So we identify that there are three ways in which organized religions actually engage 
in the sustainability transition. The first is via public campaigning. So this is in contribution towards public debates. Uh, we see that, for example, also in contributions towards things like the Fridays for Future movement, where there has been an additional movement set up called Churches for Future. Uh, the second area is materialization. So this is physical actions that take place in order to support the transition. So this might be, for example, the introduction of uh, photovoltaic panels on church roofs, energy efficiency measures to try and improve the performance, things which can actually be physically measured. And the third area, which is probably the most important, I'd say, is in value dissemination. And this often takes place in the form of uh, religious sermons, which have a specific focus towards pro-environmentalism uh, or sustainability issues. Uh, this happens within the churches themselves. So we looked at these three different forms. And uh, what we did is we actually conducted a series of interviews. There were 30 interviews that were conducted throughout Switzerland. These were held in both the German and the French speaking part of Switzerland. And they took on average about an hour each. Some were slightly longer, some were slightly shorter, of course. The interviews were with both members of congregations. So this is in a, on a more micro scale, if you like. Uh, and when we're talking about micro scale with congregations, what we tried to do is we tried to approach uh, leaders of these congregations. So we're talking about pastors, priests, uh, members who were actually paid within each congregation. But we also conducted 10 interviews within umbrella organizations and umbrella organizations span multiple congregations. So they may have been, for example, organizations such as ERKU over here, which is a, a Christian outreach program that encompasses multiple different congregations, but which focuses purely on environmental measures, or it may be, for example, a church umbrella group uh, such as uh, the Catholic Church as a whole, rather than looking at specific members of congregations. As I mentioned before, these are currently all Christians. So uh, within the data that I'm going to be presenting today, this was specifically Christian. The previous paper, we also uh, interviewed a number of different members uh, of other religious groups around the world. Um, so we also spoke to, for example, Buddhists and Muslims uh, and some uh, which would potentially be considered fringe groups. Um, all of the organizations that we contacted were already engaged to some extent in environmental issues. So what we weren't trying to do was to establish whether religions as a whole were becoming green. Rather, we were trying to determine whether those that are greening already are able to do so effectively and what are the issues that they encounter as they do so. So the interviews were transcribed and coded using Max QDA. Um, and following that, we have already written a uh, scientific paper, which will be available hopefully in the next few months. It will be going into peer review. So often this takes a little while, but once it's out of peer review, it will be uh, published uh, open access. So everybody will be able to read this. Now, in order to use a framework that we felt would really make sense, we found uh, that the donut economic framework um, from uh, Kate Raworth uh, made the most sense. And if uh, that's up on the screen at the moment, uh, the donut economics framework basically looks at how we can produce a safe and just space for humanity. Uh, on the lower side, we have a social foundation which needs to be met in order to have this safe and just space. So, and this is the area that's pri uh, primarily been addressed so far by lots of the activities within church organizations. So maintaining levels of uh, basic nutrition, pro uh, providing extra healthcare, extra education, working on gender equality, providing housing and so on. Uh, this is a really important work. It's important that we make sure that that social foundation is met. And it's also important that we recognize that the church has already played a significant role in making sure that this social foundation is met. Where there has been much less engagement is on the other side, the ecological ceilings. And really, this is what we're trying to look at here. So uh, if you look at what's beyond the ecological ceiling in the model, the overshoot involves for example, climate change, ocean acidification, chemical pollution, land conversion, biodiversity loss, and so on. These are all things which traditionally have been seen as outside the scope of what the church should engage on. However, now, as the climate crisis begins to get uh, significantly worse, 
and uh, uh, seems to be going um, in a very, very clear direction, um, there's a clear call for us to start engaging in that as well. So we tried to uh, bring this together and we, we tried to look at how we can look at the donut model, donut economics model within the capital framework of natural, physical, financial, social and human capital. Natural capital, we're really referring to things like biodiversity projects, recycling and so on. Uh, we can readily see forms of materialization, uh, which are very, very much active in church participation. Physical capital, we're looking at the buildings and the structures which are used. And here again, we can see how green energy is being implemented straight away. Uh, this may involve simply switching providers. So we're not necessarily saying that people have to install photovoltaic panels, although a number of congregations are already going that much further and are already installing photovoltaics, for example, but also introducing further energy efficiency measures. Although this is part of materialization, so here we do see physical differences, by doing so this also has an effect on value dissemination within the own community, but also in public campaigning as others see what is being done and may wish to emulate this. Financial capital is also very important. Here we're looking at cost effectiveness, but we're also looking at further measures. What can be done? So we, for example, wanted to see about divesting. Are churches discussing divesting with their members or not? This is a topic which, again, from the top down, has been brought to the attention of members on multiple occasions, but is still relatively new. We looked at social and symbolic capital, and here we're looking at things like temperature reduction, which of course is affected by financial capital because it means that there's a direct saving. But what happens when you reduce the temperature in churches? Um, sure, there's a, a financial saving, but how do members perceive this? Is this seen as being something that has value or is it counteractive actually? Does it have a negative effect? We're also looking at educational campaigns which may take place both within the community and uh, uh, greater afield of course. Human capital, we're looking at educational levels, support for external organizations and also here we're including support for umbrella organizations which may be same faith or different faith and we're also looking at green sermons and how often they're used, the contribution that this may take place. So in the field of natural capital, quite unsurprisingly, really, there was uh, a lot happening. But the barriers and the tensions involved were minimal. And one of the reasons for this, we believe, is that, of course, when we're doing biodiversity projects, for example, bat protection projects, or, uh, projects, swift boxes in churches, uh, Laudato Sea Gardens, which increase biodiversity, urban gardening and so on, uh, the effect of this is local. It's seen locally and therefore it makes it much easier to get people on board. Because if, uh, if you talk about greater topics and this whole idea of global climate change, people aren't that interested. They want to see what's happening locally and how it's going to affect them directly. So to know, for example, that your church is doing something to protect a species of bats, which is very rare, uh, often bats in particular are uh, no longer able to find habitats in urban areas because homes are built in such a way that they no longer have a space for them. And if homes are energy efficient, uh, or have retrofitted energy efficiency measures, then what often happens is that they get uh, redone in such a way that there is no space provided for these creatures. So churches are seen almost as the last bastion where these animals can coexist with humanity in a way which is completely okay for us. Um, so this is something that is being done. And as I say, it seems to have an awful lot of support. We'll move on to the next form of capital because this is where things begin to get a little bit more tense and where we begin to see some conflict between members and what's being done. So we have certification, which takes place in different churches in Switzerland. Certification is called the, the green uh, uh, rooster, Grüne Google, uh, within the German speaking area, or Eco Eglise within the French speaking area. And they have very specific goals and measures. So the first is a switch to renewable energy. This doesn't necessarily mean that people will install renewable energy, rather that they will simply switch providers. However, there is an awful lot that's happening. So for example, the Lensburg Parish has switched to pellet heating. A number of churches are of course uh, switching to fitting uh, photovoltaics. 
there's a problem with that, of course. We have a number of very, very beautiful old churches in Switzerland, and the idea of installing photovoltaics on these churches is great. We have the roof space for them. However, the buildings may not be suited. Uh, ancient buildings may not be able to cope with the additional weight on the roof. And more importantly, we have legislative barriers which are quite serious. Uh, these buildings are often protected, and the idea of coating the entire roof with photovoltaics may make financial sense, but in terms of buildings planning, it's a big no-no. It's simply not permitted. The second area that they look at is to try and reduce waste. Well, here again, we tried to measure if uh, uh, congregations were installing, uh, for example, some form of recycling system. But installing a recycling system is one thing. Getting people to use it is a completely different thing. Um, and we noted that almost all of them say, oh, yeah, yeah, we have the, the means to recycle. Uh, however, we don't monitor how much this is used. And there is some indication that these aren't used quite as frequently as they should be. The idea of increasing biodiversity goes back to natural capital and to things like installing bee meadows, installing small areas of vast biodiversity, microforests, if you like, in urban areas, which have a huge effect on increasing not just local bi biodiversity, but also in, uh, for example, reducing urban heating, because these can provide islands of cooling in urban areas in hot summers. And also, curiously enough, they seem to balance temperatures in the winter and mean that you have areas that need less heating in the winter. Uh, I've put up a quote from uh, one of our interviews that uh, said literally, hey, well, now it's 18 degrees. We have believers who come into the church and say that they're freezing. Now, this is something where we need to see some behavior change because are people genuinely freezing at 18 degrees? This is 18 degrees centigrade, by the way, for those of you that operate in Fahrenheit. 18 degrees centigrade uh, is cool, but is not a freezing temperature. I mean, it's, it's still relatively pleasant. Um, if it's 18 degrees inside, it's normally 10 degrees outside or less. This means that people are coming in with their coats and they're simply used to taking their coats off and sitting in a very warm building. Um, we could try to assist members, try to educate members to make sure that they keep their jackets on. There is also a move to try and provide blankets for people in church so that they can still sit there and be relatively comfortable. This has a knock-on effect on the environment. So the, uh, the idea of uh, reducing the temperature, sure, there's a financial savings that's made, but it's not being done for the financial savings. It's been done on environmental reasons because if we're able to keep the temperature low, then we will ultimately be able to reduce how much energy we're consuming. Even if that energy is produced through renewables, if we're using less energy, the best energy is, of course, the energy which is saved. Moving on to financial capital, here the case for any kind of action is now really, really very marked. Uh, and when I say marked, uh, financially, the grounds for installing any kind of uh, photovoltaic system or um, a system which is energy efficient are now huge financially. Uh, there's a profit to be made apart from anything else. So if you install photovoltaics on your building, there's a huge profit that you can make uh, in the region at the moment over here in Switzerland of up to 6% a year return on your investment. So purely on a financial basis, we can say, hey, this should happen. And yet it's not happening everywhere. Places where it's happening, I, I think if you can see in the picture, we've got the Capuchin Monastery in Schwitz, a uh, beautiful monastery. They were able to coat it with uh, photovoltaic panels. So they now have renewable energy, which is used also for heating and hot water. So this is not just photovoltaic panels so much as solar panels, uh, which have hot water going through them or rather chemicals going through them that's then used to heat hot water. We can make significant savings. And indeed, in the case of the Capuchin Monastery, they see a saving of 75,000 kilos of CO2 annually, uh, simply by having swapped system. Also, a massive reduction in costs um, but really, one of the problems is that, uh, yes, we can make the financial case for doing this, but the church already has a lot of money invested in projects, as I mentioned earlier on, which are often connected to the social boundary, the, the lower level of that donut model, where we're saying people need that money to provide housing, to provide the basic necessities of food and water for people, 
Um, so to try and find the resources or to divert resources is not that easy. Uh, one of the suggestions that we came up with was that uh, they could crowdfund amongst members specifically to make sure that these projects are done with a view to making sure that any return on investments, as I mentioned earlier, the 6% return could be then plowed back into making sure that that social boundary is met. So that extra 6% a year could then go towards meeting the lower social boundary, whilst at the same time we're tackling the higher end, the ecological ceiling that's being met. So the problem is, as I say, we have these structures that are very embedded within the church. And so to try to find this uh, extra, uh, extra resources to invest in these new fields is proving to be quite difficult, even when there's a will. In the area of social capital, you may be wondering why I've uh, put up the image of a rather strange looking vehicle here. And naturally speaking, vehicles would uh, fit under probably financial capital because there's a financial savings and having an eco vehicle that's electric. Um, or it could be put under physical capital because this is something physical. But actually, one of the main effects of having uh, a mini electric car, this is uh, the, the pastor uses this vehicle to travel, um, is that it's incredibly visible. As symbolic capital, this plays a huge role. Not just members of the congregation, but members of the wider community see the pastor. In the past nine months, he's driven 6,000 kilometers. That's about 4,000 miles. Uh, this tends to be short journeys within the parish, and so it's incredibly visible. Uh, it's also outperforming in terms of the battery cycles that it's meant to have. Part of this is because the pastor used to be an engineer, and so he knows what he's doing, and he's been able to tinker with the device to make sure that it outperforms what it's meant to be doing. This has a, a remarkable change. However, again, it's very local. What happens, though, is that people see this, they begin to think, actually, we could also purchase uh, uh, an e-vehicle. This might make a difference in the long run, most definitely. It's also being very local. It means that there is tension sometimes in what's happening in the wider sphere. So people may use an electronic vehicle, but at the same time, they then still take their two holidays a year where they fly by plane. And so is it really addressing the problem as fully as it should? We would argue that perhaps not. But we would also argue that this is having a significant role and that shouldn't be underestimated. In terms of human capital here, we're also talking about what people are doing within the wider community. And uh, there was a vote on the 18th of June over here. Uh, I'm pleased to say that the Climate Protection Act did pass with 59% of the vote. Uh, Switzerland has numerous referendums. These take place regularly every couple of weeks, pretty much there's a new referendum. and. Uh, in order to make sure that this referendum was passed, there was active campaigning on behalf of multiple church organizations. So we have um, umbrella organizations that also then asked individual congregations to put their name to this, to make sure that they were actively campaigning within their communities. In order to actively campaign, they weren't just re releasing public statements, they were also collecting donations, and they did have a ceremony, which was uh, on the 20th of May, uh, to bid farewell to a glacier because the glaciers are melting. And this is very, very clear over here in Switzerland. The direct effect of climate change is very, very visible. Um, on the other hand, as you can see from the quote at the bottom, what is the church doing in ecology? We have nothing to do with it. There is significant pushback from people that say, hey, this isn't our role. The role of the church is in saving souls. Uh, yes, we can pay some lip service to this idea of creation care, but ultimately this isn't for us to do. There are other organizations that do this better. Uh, and not only do we not support, support the church taking action, we will directly campaign against this. To the point that, for example, there's an organization which is sending out leaflets and emails to different people to say, um, are these people genuine Christians? This is purely within the Christian church. Um, is this the message of the church or has this somehow been obfuscated by an environmental message which has nothing to do with what we're meant to be doing regardless of the fact that ultimately within the church establishment from the very top down we have significant support for environmental engagement now really when we look at what's being done 
um, it's very easy to say, well, there's stuff that's happening. We can see that there is engagement to some degree and therefore we'll say, all right, well, the job's done. But how does this compare within the Swiss social sphere? So it's very hard to find organizations that are similar to the church because the church has an incredible reach, huge numbers of members and relatively uh, huge numbers of resources that they can tap into. Um, so these aren't comparisons that I would say are necessarily fair for the church. Uh, when we look at the pharma industry over here uh, in the area of Basel, we have a number of uh, uh, companies within the pharma industry that are incredibly wealthy and are also incredibly committed towards making sure that their engagement in environmental action is relatively high. Uh, one example is Roche, the pharmaceutical company Roche, which has committed to net zero by 2050. This is a much greater commitment than most church organizations. But of course, it's a business organization. It has vast amounts of profits and it has specific teams which focus on sustainability and it can plow money into these schemes. From a top-down perspective, it simply says, all our buildings are gonna be self-powered through our own energy sources, which will be renewable. Um, and they do it regardless of the cost, regardless of any internal dissent, this is what's gonna happen. They have the resources to be able to do that. So perhaps it's not the best comparison. So we then tried to look at something that was maybe more comparable to the idea of uh, congregations on a congregation level. And really what we have locally in, in areas where we have congregations, we also have sports clubs. When it comes to sports clubs, there's significant engagement in sustainability topics. This is really quite curious. So they're very, very much engaged. We have, for example, the installation of photovoltaics. We have uh, swimming pools that are now running on uh, uh, pellets uh, where energy efficiency measures have been introduced to make sure that they're highly energy efficient. Uh, there's also an umbrella organization. The logo up there, Sustainable Sports, is actually from an umbrella organization which works to try and help these sports clubs become more sustainable and really focus on sustainability issues. There's also a sustainable sports campaign on a Swiss wide level. So when we compare this to congregational engagement, it's really difficult to say that uh, congregations are doing any more than what these sports groups are doing. So there's clearly the room for further engagement. I don't want to say that uh, there's, uh, there is an engagement, there most definitely is engagement from the side of the churches, but the potential for engagement nevertheless is significantly more than what we're seeing currently. And this is where we're hoping that things will change in the coming years. There are enormous areas of conflict, and that's also really important to know. So within the context of uh, what's happening in Switzerland, it has to be said that, yes, there's an awful amount of social pressure. Uh, the politics over here in Switzerland play a large role in what's being done and what's not being done. The definition of what is green and what isn't is also very different according to different places. Uh, but also, we do have this alternative engagement priorities, this idea that we need to focus on social welfare, discrimination, aiding refugees. These are areas that the church excels in already. And we cannot expect them to take resources away from these areas where they are very much needed to place into engagement in environmental issues. However, there is some uh, uh, room for synchronicities between the two. We can see, for example, the idea of creating community gardens where we have refugees engaged directly that increase biodiversity. So there are areas where we could combine them both. We noted one of the main areas also for conflict is that if we have members of staff that aren't committed and that are critical, engagement is much lower. So in churches and congregations where we have high levels of engagement from staff, we're able to see, of course, that this is translated into much more in terms of action. At the same time, for example, in the parish of Zurich, all churches in the Reformed Church, all, of, all the congregations have been asked from above, from a top-down perspective, to become certified as green roosters. So this means that they have to change the source of their energy. It has to be renewably sourced, and they have to start engaging in ideas about how they're going to manage waste in a more eco-friendly way, for example. 
often though in terms of theology this idea of green guidelines is still not perceived as being the main role of the church despite the fact that it is coming down louder and louder from uh, uh, the upper echelons of the church that we need to be doing more this still isn't translating everywhere it's still not perceived as the main role there are structural issues as well this whole idea of us having umbrella organizations is great and is definitely having an effect i'll come on to that slightly more on the next slide it's not always positive you see that's one of the issues and of course the resources is a major issue particularly because often the churches don't belong or they're on land that doesn't belong to the church and a building that is rented of course offers much less scope in what you can and cannot do when it comes to for example installing photovoltaics so yeah one of the big problems that we discovered is that we have these umbrella organizations which are fantastic and which are doing a great job but one of the quotes from uh, one of the congregations was that the interfaces between the congregations and the umbrella organizations aren't working uh, often they don't know who to go to there's also this perception that when they do go towards the umbrella organizations that they can then leave it purely in the hands of these groups because it's not perceived as being the role then of the congregations they say well we have the umbrella organization that's going to deal with that for us we can then wash our hands of it and just focus on the other work of the church which we see as being just as important or more important however the clear structure from the Grüne google from this green rooster program does mean that there is increased engagement in the churches where this is happening um, and although it's a fixed pathway it may limit additional actions the actions that are taking place are overwhelmingly positive and they are taking place so this is an area where engagement is most definitely happening curiously enough in the case of switzerland we have an area where um, there's a difference that's quite dramatic and that uh, may be culturally determined and it's between the german and the french speaking areas within the german area it's a lot clearer so the actions are much more directive uh, whereas in the French speaking area, uh, it's often left more in the hands of the congregations themselves as to what they do and how they do it. Um, this difference has been perceived in other areas, so it's not purely in environmental issues. It has been already registered in uh, previous research that's been done in Switzerland that there is this cultural divide. Uh, indeed, it, the border is quite marked between what's known as the French speaking area and the German speaking area. I should also note here that although Switzerland does have a small Italian speaking area, this was seen as being outside the scope of our research, partly due to funding because it's a very small area. And of course, conducting the interviews in Italian meant adding a further language and a further layer of complexity to the research. So that was why this was excluded. So to conclude, what I would say is that, yes, there is engagement. It is taking place. However, of course, how it takes place is defined very differently by the different organizations and the form that it takes place is very, very different. There's also a, a very, very difficult conflict between the need to accommodate the different desires for engagement or, more importantly, non-engagement by different members. We had some people saying that their members, particularly in the older generations, were saying that any kind of engagement in sustainability issues was, to quote, the work of the devil. At the same time, we have many uh, of the interviews discussed how younger generations uh, amongst their membership talked about how if they didn't engage, this was going to cause huge problems and they were going to lose more members. Uh, there's an element of fear here that if they didn't engage, they would lose members, but by engaging, they also encounter resistance and lose members. So it's really a balancing act to try and see what the best way is forward for the church. Ultimately, what I would say is that there's significant potential for the church uh, to engage greater in sustainability transitions. In order for this to happen, however, there may be a need for sustainability stakeholders outside of the church to interact better with religious organizations and to actually try and increase and magnify this reach. And this may, for example, take place through direct engagement with congregations, uh, being asked to give talks within churches, anything like that. There is a uh, bright future, I believe. I'm an optimist, and I will finish on that note by saying that although the current effect of uh, what we're doing to the planet is, uh, is quite significant, 
I do believe that there is a possibility for us to have a bright future. However, there is most definitely need for greater engagement. I'm going to leave you with that. If any of you have any questions, I'm more than happy to attempt to answer them. Thank you very much. And also, you've got my email up on the screen. If you need to get in touch with me at any time, please feel free to do so. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Hearn. Excellent presentation. Um, I'm sure we have questions. I'm going to start by by opening the floor to our, our convener here. Uh, Stephen, if you have anything you, you want to offer, I've got some of my own, but always love to hear what you have to say. Um, yes, excuse my background at the moment. It's still on a virtual background without a green screen. Um, Adam, very interesting. I, As you know, I'm also involved in the church quite a lot, and, and these topics come up a lot. Here in Germany, we have something called the Micha Initiative, which has got something to do with the prophet Micha prophesying the end of things. I've got two questions for you. Firstly, in terms of the Western world, the ecological crisis may well be a Christian crisis stemming from Genesis 1, you know, where God creates all of creation, argues that human beings are the pinnacle and that they should have dominion over creation. And really for 2000 years, we've been using that dominion as an excuse to do whatever we want. Do you see anything of that theology in your interviews and your discussions? That would be my first question. I'll let you answer that and then I've got another one for you as well. Thanks a million. Yes, I would say uh, we would expect to see that. Um, we would expect to see this element of dominion coming through. But I would remind you that when we did our interviews, what we were specifically looking at is congregations and umbrella organizations that were already engaged to some extent in sustainability issues. So these are people that have already gone through those difficult conversations to have, uh, where ultimately it comes down to a theological interpretation of what is meant by dominion. Is there this need for creation care, or are we the pinnacle? Should we be looking after what some have referred to as our brothers and sisters, the plants and the animals, or are we meant to be saying, no, you know, we, we will do whatever we want? Uh, ultimately, the ones that we engaged with, the ones that we were interviewing, were already taking steps in the direction of environmental sustainability. And so as such, for them, this whole idea of dominion was already um, something that they discussed and they redefined the term, if you like, as, as being much more towards creation care rather than dominion over. Or if you like dominion, I mean, what is dominion over? Is it, it's, it's very easy to reinterpret that and to say dominion doesn't mean that we don't have a responsibility. Uh, you know, this whole idea of caring for the environment doesn't mean that we don't dominate over it. We still dominate over it. I mean, we're in the Anthropocene now. We're, we're all aware that uh, uh, mankind dominates the planet. But how we do so doesn't necessarily have to be negative. And I think at the moment, the word Anthropocene is almost like a dirty word. We talk about it and we say, oh, we're in the Anthropocene. This is terrible. Does the Anthropocene have to be terrible? Uh, and perhaps it's the church's role to say, yes, we're in the Anthropocene, but rather than dominate over, our dominion needs to be that we take care of the planet. Yes, our footprint is everywhere, but our footprint needs to be light. Our footprint needs to be careful footprint. I hope that's answered to some extent. So an ambulance just drove. Don't worry, it happens. I hope it's nothing serious. Yeah, there is something serious going on there. But, and then my other question is churches are firstly slow to move. And certainly the, the core understanding of most congregants is a core mission. And our mission, not that I agree with it, but certainly for most people is to save souls. And it's very hard for churches to do anything that doesn't have a saving souls, at, you know, motive in it. Um, in fact, all the church's social actions in the past, whether that started hospitals or schools or, you know, helping prostitutes have always been to spread the news of, you know, the gospel and save souls. How do churches then see, Do is there any indication as how do they see cleaning up the environment and saving souls. I mean, I understand how, how starting a school, it can brainwash the kids in a certain sense, but 
What does cleaning up the environment save souls? How does that work? Well, really, I think here it depends on your interpretation of this, because I would say it's exactly the same thing. Uh, so, sure, in terms of the natural capital, when we're looking at uh, setting up a, um, a, a bee-friendly meadow or putting in a bat box, these things aren't necessarily going to be saving souls. What they might do, though, is they might help to improve the well-being of the people who live in the area, which then has a knock-on effect on saving souls, if you like. But when we look at the wider questions that we're talking about here, uh, biodiversity loss may not be a huge or a perceived problem at the moment. Uh, but further down the line, we already know that biodiversity loss is going to have a huge impact on, for example, environmental production when it comes to agriculture. So if we're not able to feed people in the future because the food won't grow because we don't have the, the, the bees that are pollinating the, the flowers and the crops, you know, this is going to have an effect. And ultimately, um, if we listen to the science, the climate science is saying, hey, look, it's not just now that we're uh, at a slight risk that civilization as we know it may end within the next 50 years. The risk is becoming so loud and clear that we have you know, scientists taking part in scientists' re uh, rebellion and, and chaining themselves to buildings and, and so on because they are scared. They are scared that effectively the end is nigh. So I would actually say that the debate really on a, a, a religious perspective where we're encountering more um, debate really is on whether we should be intervening to save to save the planet or not. Um, and here, again, uh, one of the interviews discussed uh, this idea of, you may well have come across this metaphor before, of uh, the man who's in his house who's very, very religious and uh, there's a big flood and as it floods, they say, you need to come with us now. And he says, no, I won't, because God will save me. Uh, and he climbs onto his roof as the flood rises. And as he's on his roof, a boat shows up and they say, climb into the boat, we'll save you. And he says, no, God will save me. And a, a bit later, a helicopter comes and says, uh, come, you know, you need to be safe because the flood waters are rising. And he doesn't because God will save him. And then he drowns. And when he arrives at the pearly gates, he says to God, why didn't you save me? And God says, what do you mean? I sent you the first people to take you out of your home. I sent you the boat. I sent you the, helic the helicopter. What else do you want? You have to take action. And I think this is more where the debate is these days. It's not in terms of whether um, what we're doing is right or, or not. It's whether we should, uh, in terms of saving souls, it's whether we should be saving souls or whether we should see this as being, if you like, the start of revelation, this whole idea of climate doomism. Um, which is quite scary when you think about it. Uh, and then is it the church's role to prevent that kind of doomism or is it their role to make sure that the church continues? Um, is this recognized as the end of the world um, or is this recognized simply as a challenge that we should rise to meet? Um, and I would hope that overall we're going to rise to meet the challenge. But the challenge nevertheless is, in my view, exactly the same as giving people food to eat. If we're going to, um, in the next few years, arrive at a point where we simply don't have the food to go around anymore, where, you know, for the first time, we're contemplating a future which is going to be worse, significantly worse for our children than it was for us. What are we going to do to, to put in place now to make sure that the future generations are protected, to save, if you like, the souls of the future generations, rather than focusing just on the ones that are living now? Do we have a duty of care? Does the church have a duty of care to the souls of people that aren't yet born? Um, and this is where I, I would say I would go with that. But uh, I mean, <laughs> Dr. Turner, I have, a, I have a question for you. I think the, the how question is a really important one because it certainly paints a picture of these are the measurable steps that are happening right now. And you're the one tracking and measuring. And it tells a, a, a very good story for those that are looking to, to create initiatives. I'm interested to hear, you mentioned there's differences between the French speaking and German speaking parts. Um, how, maybe you can elaborate on those differences, where you see the sources, and maybe what are the, what are the some perceived barriers kind of within those two case studies? Really here, uh... I think it, partly it is a cultural difference. So this laissez-faire attitude, which is more common in the French-speaking part, is 
in stark contrast towards a much more Germanic, uh, 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 using the traditional sense of Germanic in terms of uh, they're known for having very strict rules. These are the rules and this is what we will do. Whereas in the French speaking part, it's like, hey, well, okay, so you want to become an Echo Eglise, um, go for it. You know, we'll give you certification. What do you want to do? And it's much more of this, yeah, kind of a laissez faire attitude. Uh, I, I would suggest, as I say, that this goes back not just uh, decades, but hundreds and hundreds of years, that there has always been stark differences and that it's almost done deliberately that way. Um, in that, uh, for example, in the case, of, as I say, of, of Echo Eglise and the, the Green Rooster projects, Green Rooster came first. Uh, and so this whole idea that there would be these fixed rules, this is how it's going to be. Um, uh, the uh, Swiss Romand, the, the French speaking part is a lot more like, well, okay, we can see that that's how they're doing it there, but that's not gonna work for us. We're just gonna make sure that it's a lot more open. Um, what I would suggest is at the moment, we're not seeing um, that the uptake is different. So we're seeing similar numbers of congregations taking part. Um, sure, the projects that, are, that they're, they're doing are slightly different, um, and there is at the moment slightly less, but I would put that down rather to being a cultural difference to being a time difference, uh, simply because the Echo Eglise movement started slightly later. Uh, and I would expect them to be in the same place where the Grüner Google, where the Green Rooster is in probably a year and a half's time, two years time. Um, so I think they, they will catch up most definitely. Um, but yes, partly it's to do with the language as well, with the fact that when um, the the French focus is often a lot more on, uh, or, or is often perceived as being more on emotions rather than on physical and material. Uh, and that then plays a huge role in, you know, where are you sourcing your energy from? Well. We have a renewable organization here, but we don't like them. So the, you know, the, the, those crazy barriers, which you think, well, that should play no no part in it. But that does play a, a much greater role. Uh, again, this idea that in the German speaking part, it is a lot more top down. Um, you are told you will go for a renewable organization. And so therefore that happens. In the French part, it's like, well, OK. Uh, it would be nice if you did that. See what you can find. Uh, you didn't find anything well okay you know there's time so it's a lot more relaxed uh, we see this i mean even in the meetings that we have with different organizations is that uh, uh, if you have a meeting with uh, congregations in the german part anecdotally speaking uh, the likelihood of it being cancelled <laughs> is significantly less than if it's in the french speaking part um, however when you have the meeting it will tend to be a lot more open and they're much more willing to discuss things uh, when we're talking about the finances, for example, financial issues are, are opaque when it comes to the church. The church organizations are much less likely to want to discuss things like where the church banks, um, which bank is being used? Have you changed bank? Are you banking with what's called a, uh, an ethical bank? Uh, or is your money tied up in uh, fossil fuels and, and arms, um, which will unfortunately still give you a relatively good return for your money? Um, are they thinking about these things or are these topics simply taboo and not discussable? And we're finding that the French side, these topics are much more open for, for debate. They're much more willing to say, well, yeah, you know, you're right. But ultimately, we have a responsibility to our projects and we need to make sure that we're funding our projects. And if we bank somewhere else, then the, the return that we have on our money is going to be significantly less. And so we need to weigh that up. Uh, divesting is however happening that's that's uh, also something that I don't know if I'd mentioned it earlier on but uh, there is definitely a movement towards pulling any kind of any kind of uh, resources away from investments in fossil fuels and also in the arms industry uh, and this is echoed with calls at a more international level from different churches yeah, I can imagine the type of information you gather is 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 certainly limited from the opacity you described. I'm wondering, wondering in what ways, if you had a magic wand and you could increase the scope of your your research, um, it, you know, it, maybe that's let's say you had a check for five million dollars and you had a whole staff. What ways would you go after uh, increasing within within reasonable means, right? I'm really glad you asked. And if you have an extra five million, we actually have a proposal that's uh, uh, been submitted to the Swiss National Foundation 
Uh, fingers crossed that it will be approved, but uh, obviously the, the, getting research funding is very, very difficult. If you gave me that money now to continue my research, what I would uh, really love to do is to engage in a survey uh, with members of congregations. So we conducted a survey already of congregations themselves, but this is at a congregational level. And what we would really like to do next is to go at the member level, the micro level, and saying, well, look, this is what your congregation is doing. This is what the umbrella organizations are doing. What are you doing as an individual? And how is this impacting you? Is it making you change your behavior? So, you know, on a small scale, for example, are you going to church in winter knowing that you're going to have to keep your coat on? Uh, are you, for example, retrofitting your home with energy efficiency measures? Are you recycling more? Have you considered engaging with uh, renewable energy directly, for example, by installing photovoltaics? Or if you live in a rented property, engaging directly by, for example, buying shares in a company that will put photovoltaics on shared buildings where you get a return or a reduction in your electricity bill? You know, what are you doing as an individual? Are you flying less? Are you taking public transport more? Have you considered using uh, electric vehicles or smaller scale mobility? Um, and I have to say, from my perspective as, uh, as a researcher, I have a car. We have one car in the family. Uh, we do use it sometimes. It's an ancient diesel car, so I'm, I'm not a role model when it comes to that. Uh, I commute using the train most of the time. But we're very lucky. We, you know, in the Swiss area, 50% of people don't own their own vehicle because there's no need to own a vehicle. We have a very, very good infrastructure of public transport, which will get you to, from A to B uh, in less time and normally for less money than if you have your own private personal vehicle. So I'm uh, sure I'm a fan of electronic cars. If you're going to get an e-vehicle, uh, Teslas are wonderful and there's all sorts of different makes out there that are great, but uh, it's not necessarily the way forward. The way forward might be in car sharing schemes. Um, and again, we have our local car sharing scheme here is predominantly e-vehicles and costs almost nothing to join. When you use it, what you pay, uh, sure, you have to pay for, for per hour, but when you compare it to, for example, a rental car, it's significantly less and it's very, very convenient. Uh, one of the people that I share an office with has said to me, oh, you know, when it comes to cars, people ask me what car I have and I say I have 40,000 cars because he's a member of a Swiss-wide scheme and uh, it means that at any given moment, he can just check on the app and say, well, there's a car two roads down. I'm going to use it to do whatever I need to do. We don't need private vehicle ownership. So what are the members doing? What are they actually engaging in directly? And there is some evidence to say that people are already beginning to take steps. Uh, I have to lift up my hand here also and say that although I'm engaged uh, uh, as a, a lay preacher myself, uh, I'm also engaged within the sustainability transition uh, as a climate pact ambassador for the European Union. And for that, I go into different schools and universities and I give talks to try and look at people's behavior change. So I'd be very, very interested in allocating funds to look at behavior change within church members. What are they doing? How are they being affected in positive ways and also in negative ways? You know, seeing a recycling bin, does that make you recycle or does that make you think, well, I'm not going to do that. This is ridiculous. There's, this, is, this is a bandwagon that everybody's jumping on. Um, when the church holds functions like a, a, a funeral ceremony for a glacier, do you attend? And if so, what are your expectations when you attend? How does it make you feel? What are your thoughts, for example, about things like the Fridays for Future movement? Um, there's a, a, a group of people that are very much in favor, but there's also a significant group of people that are completely against and if so why you know to try and establish what do people believe in the on a scientific level on a research level we know now that 99 percent of scientists agree that climate change man-made climate change is happening this is uh, pretty much un, uh, undisputed uh, but from a church perspective a membership level are we still seeing climate change denialism um, i I would suggest from the conversations that I've had that that is still occurring to some degree. Uh, and if so, are people beginning to shift? There's research from the States, uh, someone called Liza Rovitz, I believe I've pronounced that correctly, uh, who's looked at the different states of mind within, within the, the US. And we have people going from concerned all the way to people who are in complete denial. Um, and already his research is showing that people are beginning to shift in the States. So it's not that we have more people that are highly concerned or alarmed 
uh, it's that we have a lot less people that are in the complete denial or in the state of being unsure. People are beginning to move across. I'd love to see, is that happening in congregations as well? What are the members actually doing? Are, are they becoming more concerned? Are the small scale actions that are taking place within their community playing a role? So for example, as I mentioned earlier on with the, the picture of the funny e-car from the, the, the pastor, what's the effect of that? The measurable impact on the congregation? Are people now beginning to, to contemplate buying their own electronic vehicle? Uh, he doesn't have photovoltaics at home. He relies on public charging to, to charge his vehicle. So this kind of already has an impact on the argument that, oh, yeah, it's fine. If you can charge for free at home, it's fine, which is a common argument that we hear against e-vehicles. Um, if you're not able to do that, but you're, you still have an e-vehicle and it's still functioning very, very well, does that have an impact on the members? Uh, so, yes, yeah, so, I mean, ideally, I would... Uh, uh, like to conduct a survey of around 5,000 people within Switzerland, members of different congregations of different religions as well, to see if there's any difference between uh, the different religions that we have in Switzerland. And although, sure, we focused on the Christian, uh, we have to note also that there is uh, a Muslim community, which is around, I'd say, 5% of the population, a Hindu community, which is around 3%. Uh, and then we have the whole eco-spirituality movements, which account for probably about another 3%. So there are these people out there, and it'd be really interesting to see what they're doing. Are they more engaged? Are they less engaged? Which are the religions that are doing more? Research tends to indicate at the moment that pantheist religions are more engaged in sustainability transitions than monotheistic religions. Uh, is this the case in Switzerland? We see a lot less engagement, but perhaps that's because of the scale. What are they actually doing? So, I mean, yeah, I, I could keep on for hours on this because, as I say, I, I've written one proposal already trying to, to beg for the funds. Uh, we are looking for funding to try and do this for a three-year project because it would make a huge difference in our understanding about where people are. This would then also feed into what the church knows about its members in terms of how they can tailor sermons to make sure that dissemination is done in a way which is as parishioner-friendly as possible. Because if you're speaking to a congregation where you still have a sizable proportion that are climate change deniers, then you need to tailor it to that uh, uh, that that uh, group. In fact, one of the leading climate scientists does a lot of outreach work in churches because she's also an, an evangelical Christian. You may have encountered her because she's a Texan or lives in Texas. At least she's a Canadian. Uh, Catherine Hayhoe. I don't know if you've come across her. Um, amazing scholar, amazing researcher, but it's also very interesting to see how she deals with predominantly evangelical Christianity and in groups where there is this issue where you still have a lot of people that are saying, well, yeah, you know, it's political. I'm going to vote against anything that comes up or I'm going to say no straight away because this is Democrats uh, and I'm a Republican. And therefore, it's nothing to do with me. Um, and so she's done a lot of work to try and bridge that gap and to say, hey, look, it's not political. Um, there's there's a whole lot going on that's going to affect us directly, particularly with farming communities. How can we find ways to reach those communities and to say, hey, look, you know, uh, you're growing crops of peanuts and your crops are failing. What can we do in order to make sure that you can join the dots and see that this is to do with climate change um, and that it's not not political. It doesn't have to be political. Of course, it is political. Everything is ultimately political to some extent. Um, but that it's, it shouldn't be a dirty word. Um, so I think the research could be really, really interesting. Uh, for us, our previous project, which was on uh, greening, the, uh, greening and religions in urban areas, focused on Germany and Switzerland. Um, this one currently is just on Switzerland, but I'd be very interested to compare between other countries as well. So to do research in congregations, not just in Switzerland, but in other countries. So that's another area for <laughs> great research. If if, the, <laughs> if that magic wand was waved and we had five million, yes, we would go there. <laughs> well, checks checks in the mail, I think. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, if anybody wins the lottery, please remember us. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we're coming to the top of the hour. I want to thank you, Dr. Hearn, for the excellent presentation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Milford, for convening. I don't know if any any final thoughts from either one of you. Great. 
thanks again for everyone, the attendance um, and, and great, great discussion here at the end. So we'll do this again shortly and I uh, wish everyone a good evening uh, or afternoon wherever you are. All right. Thank you thanks. very much. Well done. Bye. Bye. Thank you.